Welcome. It's good to see everyone again. <laughs> we have been talking about what? Two the two witnesses, exactly. And last time we were talking about Philadelphia, especially. So I'm going to pick up where we left off at the end of Revelation chapter 11. And we're going to see a lot more in that last verse there. And we're also going to connect this with the waters of Smyrna. You'll understand later why I chose that title. So first, we will look at uh, Philadelphia in the context of that last passage of Revelation, and then we'll transition to the waters of Smyrna. So let's just jump right in. Starting at Revelation 11, verse 11 for context. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So who is them? The two witnesses, exactly. So after three days and a half, and that brings us to the end of the sign of the Son of Man, as we discussed in our first presentation on this series. And of course, the word after means uh, within. It's the Greek word meta. And so these things happen leading up to the end of that period. Continuing on. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnants were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. So this verse, Revelation eleven thirteen, is where we're going to spend a considerable amount of time understanding the details of what is being expressed there. Last time, we just had an, some initial ideas. But now we'll look at it and dissect it word by word. And starting with this 10th part of the city that fell, what does that really mean? And what city is it actually talking about? So let's look at that word by word in the Greek. And when we do, we see the 10th part is the Greek word dekatos and city is Polis. Now, for the reader who reads the Greek, if they were reading this and they see that phrase, if they just contract the phrase, you have the beginning with deca and the end with polis. And so a contraction would lead to the word Decapolis, and that is actually a region that is mentioned in the Bible. And so this passage hidden in the language is this reference to a place in Israel. So let's look at that and see if we can get some clues, because it seems that God is giving us a hint that will lead us to understand this phrase, the 10th part of the city, more clearly so that we can identify exactly what city that was. The reference to Decapolis, one of three, is in Mark chapter 5, verse 20. And it speaks of 
the man who was healed from or cleansed from the demons. He departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. All right. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about the story here, but the word, the name Decapolis was a reference to this region, and it was known as the Ten City region, hence the name Deca for ten, polis, city, ten city region. That's how it was known, and they referred to it by that name, Decapolis. So where is that region, and what can we learn from it? When we look at the map, we see that these ten cities in pink are the cities of the region of Decapolis. Most of them in this general area here to the northeast of Jerusalem and then Damascus being a little bit further away. Now is there anything interesting about these ten cities? When we look at their names, most of them are not so familiar to us, but then we come down to Philadelphia. There was a town in Israel called Philadelphia, or in, in this region of Decapolis. And that, of course, ties very closely with our theme of the two witnesses. Now, we have one city out of ten. What fraction is that? It's a tenth part, exactly. So when we look at that in terms of Revelation 11, we'll see that it fits with that tenth part of the city that fell, which is Philadelphia. So let's look at that. The same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part, so Philadelphia, of that city fell. All right, so the tenth part of Decapolis, contracting that, and we see then Philadelphia fell. Now, maybe that doesn't ring quite right, <laughs> Philadelphia falling, but what really does that word fell mean? When we look at the definition, the Thayer's definition especially, it says to descend from a higher place to a lower. So that's the, the broadest sense of the meaning of that word fell. Of course, it includes other definitions as well, but the basic notion that it conveys is a descending from a higher place to a lower place. And the same hour, there was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. When we come to our passage, we can understand better what fell is actually referring to, this descending from a higher place to a lower place. So when it says the tenth part of the city fell, the tenth part of the city is Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia descended from a higher place to a lower place, just like we talked about last week. So this is a confirmation of that study with the wave sheaf offering of the first fruits coming back down, focusing on that aspect. All right, so we can just put that in brackets there, Philadelphia descended from above. That's how we can understand that phrase, the tenth part of the city fell. So in the symbolism of heaven, we see Philadelphia in this center area with the dove especially, and that's where we see this symbolism of Philadelphia coming down, descending down, like 
the latter rain. That's the Holy Spirit. Philadelphia comes down, delivers the latter rain through the Spirit. Now, I've never mentioned it here, but we've written an article about it some time ago, that in the sign of the Son of Man, we can see the Ark of the Testament. The article is in the monogram series. The Ark of the Testament is opening, I believe is the name of it. And there we point out how different, the different items that were in the Ark can be seen here. And one of those items was the bowl of manna. And that bowl of manna represents the, or is represented by the dove the Holy Spirit that gave the food and the sustained the people in the wilderness. And that, that portion of manna, it was a, a one day supply of manna. It was one portion for the day. And now we can understand how that applies because that one day in prophetic terms is one year. And that's the amount of time that we have after the earthquake, after Philadelphia comes down, the church comes down, brings that portion, that one year supply represented in that one day bowl of manna. So they will be the ones then feeding God's people during that time, feeding those who will come and be a part of God's harvest. Okay. The same hour is a reference to what? The same hour as what? If we look back at the previous verse, it tells us they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. And that is when the same hour is referring to. When they ascended up, the same hour they came back down. So that confirms again that brief period of lifting up and coming back down. The same hour there was that great earthquake. But what is that earthquake? I think that itself is revealing. We won't look too much at it, but I just want to point out that in the Greek, the word earthquake, the word that's used here for earthquake, refers, it's a broader term than how we use the term earthquake. The Greek is the word seismos, from which we get our seismic activity, and it just means a commotion but it can refer either to a commotion of the ground, as in an earthquake, or a commotion of the air, like a very powerful gale force wind. And in fact, the first time that this Greek word is used in the Bible is in Matthew chapter eight, when there was a great tempest in the sea in so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but Jesus was asleep. So, again, I'm not going to elaborate on the story, although I think there may be some interesting points there in relation to our theme. But let's move on and identify these seven thousands. Who are these 7,000 who are slain? Okay. Well, first of all, 7,000 is just seven times 1,000. And 1,000 in the Bible is a symbolic number that means many. So here we have seven times many. So that's one step. But what, what does the seven represent. And to understand that, we can look in the heavens at 
the horologium. And we see that in the mouth of the fish, there is exactly that seven. The number seven, the seventh hour of the clock, is right there at the entrance of the fish. So that suggests to us that the many are many who enter in through the door. Christ is that door, the seven, at the entrance of the sign of the Son of Man. Those are the many that are referenced in Daniel chapter 12, where it says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So those many who are turned to righteousness, they are the 7,000 who come to the knowledge of the truth in this time when Philadelphia is delivering the manna in the wilderness, so to speak. Now, there's a temptation among Christians to see the rapture more as a selfish thing. <laughs> it's like, yay, I get to escape all the trouble on the earth and everybody else, well, they have to endure it because they were bad. But the Bible gives us counsel to think in a different way because in fact, as we see now, those who are spared are indeed spared and, and that's a blessing, but they have a work to do. And that work, you know, everything that God does, he, it's not self-centered. It's all directed to others. It's a giving work. Yes. It's a ministry, yes. And in the book of Jude, we see that represented or explained to us here, where he says in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we should always be centered in his love, looking for mercy for others, rather than just wanting mercy for ourselves. Let us not be self-centered. Continuing in this passage, and some of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So here he brings out a contrast. Some, we have compassion, that is, spare them from trial. And then others, let them endure the fire, but save them, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So let's look at first those some that have on which we should have compassion. He continues speaking about them. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now this expression is mimicked in the book of Revelation in the context of the 144,000, where it says, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They're faultless before the presence of his glory. So we see that Jude is referring essentially to this same company, those who are without fault. They're the first fruits. And finishing off the passage, he says, to the only wise God, our Savior, the only one who is able to present us faultless, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So all the glory belongs to the Lord, of course. This being presented faultless is not because they're so wonderful. It's simply the 
the grace of the Lord to bring them to that place where they can be presented faultless. Then there are the others who are to be saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. We see that represented in the sign. We talked about the furnace there before, where the Holy Spirit is that fire in the furnace. And you see an illustration of how hot it gets, melting the ore so that the pure metal can be extracted from it. And that's looking down on the top of the furnace. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver, God says. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. So the heat that the Spirit gives is affliction. It's a furnace of affliction, and it tries those in that time so that they are purified in the end because their garments were spotted, like Jude said, and they need to be washed in that time of tribulation. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This coming from Revelation chapter 7, the referring to the harvest after the 144,000 are described as being sealed. Then we see the harvest coming into play. Those who came out of great tribulation and washed their robes. Those are those who endured that furnace of affliction during that time. They're also described in Revelation 15, when he says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So the sea of glass, we have long connected that with the Orion Nebula, which is like a sea and glass because it's transparent, mingled with fire from all of the stars that are there. But of course, that also refers to the fire of the furnace, that furnace of affliction through which the people go. And most pictures of the Orion Nebula have this reddish tone to them, Perhaps we can see that representing the blood of the martyrs, like the grapes, the church of Smyrna coming in at this time. Now, the word glass for the sea of glass is not a common word in the Bible. They didn't have in ancient times glass like we have in our windows. But it comes from the looking glasses of the women. They were made of brass. They would polish the brass as best as they could, and they would kind of see their reflection enough that they could comb their hair or something. <laughs> so in the, uh, it's interesting in Exodus 38 where it describes how they were building the sanctuary. They used these looking glasses. He made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass from the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of congregation. So they all brought their looking glasses as an offering. And then they formed them instead into the laver. Now, what was the laver? What did it represent? They used it to wash. It's also, it's cleansing. They would wash their hands in it, and that perhaps relates to the washing of the robes. And it's also a symbol of baptism. And we've seen that many times before 
in the sign of the Son of Man as well. So we have this baptism into the blood of, of Christ, essentially. That's the baptism that Smyrna endures during that time. And I hear Jesus gives counsel to the church of Smyrna, and he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. So he is consoling them that, yes, there is suffering that they must endure, but don't fear those things. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So here we see that Jesus encourages them to be faithful unto death. And that is why the symbolism of the grapes is used in the harvest, this baptism into blood, because the enemy is working very diligently to kill God's people who would remain faithful in that time. And that is the trial of, of the tribulation period all the persecution that they must endure. So looking back now at our passage in the end of the story of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, I want you to see the contrast that is drawn here in these last verses. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. Who is it talking about? The two witnesses. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. That's who? <laughs> right? The, they are the, the enemies of the two witnesses. That's brought out in the next verse. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. Who's they? The two witnesses again. And their enemies beheld them. So we see in these verses this contrast. We have the two witnesses and the enemies. The two witnesses and the enemies. And continuing this pattern into verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, that is, Philadelphia descended from heaven. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, that's referring to the church of Smyrna. So here we have who? Philadelphia and Smyrna, the two earthly witnesses. So then we would expect, following the same pattern, the rest of the verse to point to the enemies following that pattern. And then it says, and the remnant, that is the rest, it's just a, a word meaning the rest of the people, were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, at first glance, that might seem like they are the righteous who are, or they are good people that it's describing here. But notice, first of all, it says they were affrighted. It means they were afraid. Jesus' counsel to Smyrna was, don't be afraid. Don't fear anything that will come to you. Endure what you have to suffer, but don't fear it. These ones, they're afraid. The, the word is a different word for fear. There is that fear that can be directed toward God, a fear of God, but that's not the word that's used here. This word is only used in the sense of being afraid. They were scared. And so that's not the Fear, it's not a fear of God that's being described there. They were simply afraid, like the fear that's described in the sixth seal, the great fear that came upon the world. And the giving glory to the God of heaven, we can understand that through Isaiah. Let's look at this brief passage in Isaiah chapter 45, where God is pleading with his idolatrous 
people. And he says, look unto me, not the idols. Look unto me and ye shall, and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, including the end of the earth in time. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. So we see brought out in these two verses, every knee will bow, every tongue shall swear. In other words, whether righteous or wicked, everybody is going to acknowledge that God is just and we have, you know, some, the righteous, who will say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. And many will come to him. But then there are those who are incensed against the Lord. They are angry because they don't like his ways. They don't want to submit to his laws. And they shall be ashamed. So, this is how we can understand how they give glory to the God of heaven. It's through their shame. They're finally humbled, not, they didn't humble themselves like the righteous do, humbling themselves before God, but they are humbled like the, like Christ, the rock. You can either fall on the rock and be broken, or the rock can fall on you and grind you to powder. That's what we're seeing here. These are those on whom the rock falls and it makes them ashamed, but there's not a real, it's not a genuine repentance. In one of the plagues, it says, they repented not to give God glory. And this, and that implies that in repentance, they give God glory. And so we can understand here, there's a form of repentance, but it's not that genuine repentance. It's an acknowledgement that, okay, okay, you're right. And it's not a change of heart. And so that's what's being described here. They were afraid and they gave God glory because they had no other choice. It was finally made completely obvious. Okay, looking at this part now, I think we have considered all the parts of this verse in detail now, and this falling down or descending of the city, we saw how it points to the Holy Spirit descending down in that time. But in the sign of the Son of Man, we have represented a seal, the Alpha and the Omega in that representation. And that's referring to Jesus, not the Spirit. So the question is, does the Spirit also have his part in the sign, because so far we have seen the Alpha and the Omega, but we haven't seen any special signature from the Holy Spirit. So let's look at what we have seen. The Alpha represents the A of Alnitak, or the Alpha of Alnitak in the Greek. Also, Alnilam. These are the stars of Orion. And the Omega points to that constellation of Orion. That's the family from which Alnitak and Alnilam come. And so, I'm different the sense of Jesus and not the 
Yes, thank you. Uh, Ang Itak representing Jesus, the wounded one, whereas Ang Lam is the middle star pointing to the Shekinah glory, if you will, on the throne, the Father. But where is the Spirit? We see the two together, the Alpha and the Omega, that form the sign of the Son of Man. But now, in this additional year, we have a little bit more. And these come from the belt stars, Alni Tak, Alni Lam. And what's the third one? Mintaka. Do we see a sign for Mintaka represented here? Now, in the Greek, Mintaka has the, begins with the Greek letter mu. And sure enough, in the sign, we can see that shape using this last part of the sign. Indeed, there is the shape. You can see the close resemblance in the cursive form especially, or italicized form, how it resembles this. That's the signature, like we have the Alpha and the Omega for the Father and the Son, then of Orion. Then we have the Mu for the Spirit, and that then finishes off the rest of the sign. Now, Jesus said of himself, I am Alpha and Omega. Did the Spirit ever say, I am the Mu? <laughs> How can we be sure that this is really what we should understand from this? The letter Mu originated from the Phoenician letter Mem, which looked like that. It was, in turn, simplified from the Egyptian hieroglyphic for water. So, originally, what we see here came from the Egyptian hieroglyphic for water. That's what the letter M represents. Also, in the Latin languages, the letter M comes ultimately from this symbol representing water. And when we speak of water in biblical terms, right from the very beginning of the Bible, we see the relationship to the Holy Spirit. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. Also, throughout the Bible, in, in Isaiah, for example, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. So he makes this parallel between water and the spirit. Most notably, though, is right in the Revelation, at the end of the Revelation in chapter 22, verse 17, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So we have the Spirit calling us to drink from the water of life. Now this has special relevance to this time, not only because the letter covers over that final year, but also because in the two witnesses, it mentions that in Revelation 11, verse 11, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. So we have the water of life, and we have the spirit of life, or we could say the spirit of the water of life entered into them. 
That's what we're seeing here at this point after the three and a half years or days. That is when the spirit of life, that water of life entered into them and they stood upon their feet. Great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And who is he talking to there? He's talking to the two witnesses, exactly. And we saw how Philadelphia, like the first fruits, is taken up. But what about Smyrna? They are the martyrs. They continue forward. But if we look at the sign, we see that it comes back to this place here where we have the water in the body of the fish. So it's both Philadelphia that is mentioned and Smyrna, but they're, they're brought up at different times. First, there's Philadelphia, like we talked about before. And then in this year, there is the call to the martyrs to come up hither. And so when we read this, the spirit and the bride say, come, we can compare that with the two witnesses story. Where are they coming to get their water? Come up hither. Now, what did Jesus say about coming? <laughs> There's a very well-known passage in Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus says, come unto me. Come, if he is in heaven, then that would be come up hither, come unto me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus said while he was on this earth. And he effectively repeats that for the martyrs. Amen. Seven also points to the Sabbath rest as they come into the rest of Christ that is represented in the sign of the Son of Man. And in the middle of Revelation chapter 14, if you recall, last time we talked about that mountain and at the peak of the mountain, there were two verses, one verse relating to Philadelphia that we talked about then. And this is the other verse that relates more to Smyrna. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And here we see those words reflecting the Sabbath rest, resting from our labor. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day was the day of rest. In Hebrews, the author elaborates on that. And he says, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. That's what we understand in the sign of the Son of Man, that 7,000, they're entering into his rest, the Sabbath rest, the seventh day. All of that represented there in that number seven at the door of the fish, the mouth of the fish. And he continued, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, 
as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, come up hither, harden not your hearts. So this is counsel to the faithful in that final year. Today, if you will hear his voice from heaven, if you will hear the voice of God from the heavens, harden not your hearts with unbelief. And so we, we see that this is a time of God's rest. It's that time of entering into his rest. Those who hadn't entered into before, now don't harden your hearts. But if you hear his voice, enter into his rest. It's speaking of that Sabbath rest. And we have connected or recognized the connection of a few important testing points with the Sabbath. What are they? All right. The revelation speaks about the number of the beast, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast. And these are points of testing for God's people. They are what will be at the root of the persecution against God's people in this severe time of trial. And so we see that contrast. God says, enter into my Sabbath rest. Keep your blood pure. Don't go with the enemy's modified blood that genetic modification that they give to us in whatever form that might take, but follow his living water. And we see there, we have the correction to the enemy's work. The enemy brings down, he pulls down on the river, but the spirit gives us the true path, the true course of the river of the water of life and the blood of life. And there's also the image test that is a very major thing even today, but it will be, all of these things will surely become more um, important, more focused, and more uh, serious in this time with more severe consequences. And so God calls us to reflect the image of God, turn away from the image of man as is illustrated in the whole LGBT alphabet soup. Exactly. The Church of Philadelphia is the one that understands the significance of those three aspects. And the mark also pointing to that Sabbath rest, entering into God's rest rather than the lockdowns that the, the world would suggest. So, Jesus points out to Philadelphia these three parts, like you were saying. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, which is, we saw that, or we see that in Orion, the name of God, represented as Alni Lam. And then the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, 
which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Now, this is the longest description of the three parts that Philadelphia is sealed with. And it would do good to look at that a little bit more closely. For example, it mentions, <laughs> it almost seems like it's answering its own question. <laughs> the, he's writing the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. But what is really the name of this city of God? Well, the New Jerusalem, if we look at that word, Jerusalem, in the Hebrew, it's actually two words. And the Hebrew words for that are Yara for Jeru and Shalom for Salem. So when we look at those two words, we understand what the name of the city means. Shalom is very well known to be safe in mind, body, or estate. In other words, peace. Shalom, peace the city of peace. And of course, that is represented with the dove, universally understood as a symbol of peace. The other word that makes up the name Jerusalem means to flow as water, hence to rain. And so, yeah, we see in the very name Jerusalem, a rain of peace, like the latter rain, to flow as water. The rain comes down and flows in the river. That's exactly what we see here. The rain coming down, the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, and flowing like a river. So the very name, Jerusalem, it was given there uh, to point us to where it's what it's talking about. And that, of course, is that area of Philadelphia, but it's emphasizing the rain, the flowing of the water, or in other words, the time of Mintaka, that mu that is illustrated from the waters. And then, the last part, I will write upon him my new name. Of course, that's long been understood as Alnitak. So what we have are the three stars of Orion's belt, the whole family, the whole divine family of Orion represented there with the dove being the representative there, pointing directly to Mintaka through that symbolism as we have described. So yes, we see those three stars, the throne of God and the family of Orion. Only tack of Orion, only lamb of Orion, the Alpha and Omega. And now we see the Mu, the spirit, Mintaka of Orion, all of them together sealing the whole message, sealing that time and indicating also that that's the end because that's the end of the character. It doesn't extend further, but that seals the whole period. Yes, amen. As, as we mentioned, here in Revelation 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, inviting us to come up to, to Him, into His rest, and let Him that heareth say, Come. You notice how this is a cascading effect. First, the Spirit and the Bride through 
Philadelphia, invite us or invite the 7,000, the many in this last year to come to drink of the water and ultimately to come up to Jesus. And then the next one is let him that heareth say come. And to each one of the churches, Jesus said, let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So all of those who have not heard this before, this is their opportunity to hear what the Spirit is saying. And what those who hear, let them also say, come. So now they are also inviting others. Everything in God's kingdom is a work of ministry. And then the last group, uh, him that is a thirst, let him come. So in this company, they're the last ones. So there's no one left to invite, but they themselves come and quench their thirst in the water of life, taking the water of life freely. Amen. So with that, we see the final seal on this additional year of time. And we see how the Bible points to two different periods. There's the come up hither for Philadelphia on May 28th of 2024 at the end of the sign of the Son of Man. And then we continue on until June 4th of 2025 after the 372 portions are given. And that is when the great resurrection exactly and all of the redeemed come up hither. And then the broadest uh, sense of the two witnesses, not just the first fruits, but the entire population of God's people are raised and caught up together with Christ in the clouds. Amen. Amen. So with that, let's stand for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your revelation. Truly, it is a revelation, though it has required a specific time in history to understand it. It is a revealing of the time, because the time, as you said in the opening words of that book, the time is at hand. And we see that so very clearly now, the time is at hand. And we ask that you will send your spirit to your people now, awaken them, that they may recognize your truths for this time, that they may be prepared and ready, having their garments without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that we may be ready to join you to be presented faultless before the presence of your glory, which brings you exceeding joy. And we're grateful for that. We are also joyful and thankful for your provision. All of these things are made possible by your spirit working in the world. There is nothing that we can claim credit for in ourselves, but it is all a gift from you. It's a revelation from you and not of our own wittiness, but just your good pleasure to reveal your word to those who desire it to know. And we thank you for, for that, for the many blessings that you give to your people. And we pray that indeed there will be a great harvest of souls in this time to come difficult though it will be, 
We're grateful to have the promise that there will be support for those who must endure that time so that in the end, the entire family can be raised incorruptible to be with you for all eternity. And that is our greatest desire to see your face and to live in eternity with you. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, Alnitak, and as we see now in the sign, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time. Amen.